Hello, and welcome to Taking the Slow Lane, Why Technology Isn't the Only Answer, part of our The Commons Live series, which brings the latest issue of The Commons to life. Our next issue, which comes out tomorrow, is called The Slow Lane, and it was guest edited by one of today's speakers, Sasha Hasselmeyer, a public interest technology fellow at New America. Sasha came to this issue with extensive experience as a social entrepreneur using public procurement as a tool for change leading government innovation projects for 135 governments in more than 40 countries, leading to better outcomes in areas like transport, energy, health, education, economic development, and social care. His idea for this issue was to look at government and nonprofit work and debate the merits of taking the slow lane when it comes to technology. He and the other speakers today will discuss the fact that, according to their experiences, not everything requires an enormous amount of technology to be thrown at it. In fact, there are times and situations as well as policies and processes that are actually worse off when technology is added to the mix. And this truism is most pronounced when social change is involved. And so that's why we'll be discussing what we're discussing today and what the slow lane is, why it matters, how technologists can push back at funders, government officials, C-level executives and partners and other stakeholders who are pushing for big change that's enabled by technology. We also have two other experts today who are going to help us explore the topic, both of whom are subjects of the common stories coming out tomorrow. They include Sonia Posse, the founder and CEO of Free From, a national organization that works to dismantle the nexus of intimate partner violence and financial insecurity, as well as Eric Dawson, the founder and CEO of Peace First, the world's largest online incubator for youth-led, youth-led social change. And so I have put together some prepared questions, but we really want this to be a conversation. So please feel free to ask any questions at any point during our discussion. And I'll take the questions as soon as they come in, as well as having a more formal Q&A period towards the end of the event. We'd also like to point out the link to sign up for the Commons, uh, which you'll find right there in the chat. Tomorrow's issue will dig deeper into these topics that we'll be discussing today and give detailed stories about our, all of our speakers. So I really hope you'll check it out. So let's get started. Uh, I'd like to ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves and explain a little more about their organizations. So I'd really like to start by welcoming Sasha, our guest editor, and ask him to introduce himself and his work. Um, in today's discussion, I know we'll all like to hear about your foray into offering software as a service to cities across the globe. And it would be great if you could just also give us a little background into how you curated this issue and how you found the folks that we interviewed. Well, yes, uh, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Sonia and Eric, for, for joining us here and, and the team behind the scenes at New America who's, who's kind of put together this panel. Um, I, I think... Um, Maybe to start out with um, my, my journey as a social entrepreneur, um, I considered for a long time to have been quite successful and um, we managed to really tackle a kind of important public problem um, in the form of public procurement, which is at local government level, 10% of world GDP that is allocated relatively poorly. And um, so we were quite successful. We reached a lot of governments. We managed to um, get a lot of traction. And I think had we run this panel five years ago, I would have said, we're, we're the fast lane problem solvers. Um, we're ruling the world, we're in all over the world. But then at some point we began to stall. You know, after quick progress, things get, got slower. And we realized that the conventional software for government or GovTech um, playbook didn't really apply to us in the way we thought. And um, I think that was mostly because we wanted to change behaviors and the intentions of government and not just automate something they were already doing. So we weren't necessarily making their life easier or, or kind of um, more elegantly run, but we actually um, asked them to change their behaviors. And um, so I struggled to really reconcile my, my own urgency for change with the available paths that we, that we saw ahead of us. Um, and, and I think one of the things that really kind of kept pulling me back was thinking about speed first, like how do we get there fast? And so at some point, some time ago, I simply accepted that slowness might be okay. 
that I wouldn't have to measure myself by how many governments, how many people, how many transactions, but maybe a different qualitative rate of change. And I began to ask myself, um, what can this look like if it was a 40 year journey instead of the four year journey we have to promise our funders and investors and ourselves all the time? Like what if we actually accept we're just starting, you know, 10 years I've done this, maybe this is just the opening chapter. And um, the other thing that kind of related to it was, um, what if also if I acknowledged that it would never be us alone who would fix the problem, right? It wouldn't be our fix. It wouldn't be our solution, but actually maybe we would work side by sides with hundreds of other organizations chipping away at the same problem in maybe slightly different ways and kind of, kind of mentally removing ourselves from this, this mindset. Um, and so, um, so that, that's kind of the slow lane for me to kind of, that's the trigger where it came from. I'm sure we'll talk about it more. Um, and I want to say, so uh, Sonia and Eric are two fantastic social entrepreneurs. We're connected um, through also the Ashoka Fellowship. I think Sonia has also been a fellow at New America um, before me. Um, but um, I was really inspired by their work because they engage the messy and complicated humanness of social change without fear, which is something venture capitalists and engineers typically shy away from. And so I really wanted to force this conversation to say, you know, what are the behaviors, the mindsets that we're tackling and what role might technology play in that? Thanks, Sasha. And I have to say, I've had so much fun working with you. Uh, over the past months, uh, you were actually the first thing I edited when I started New America. So not you, you're one of your pieces. So uh, I really, I, I love your work and, and I'm really excited to be working with you. So, um, so let's bring in our next speaker. Um, and that is uh, Sonia Posse. Um, so Sonia, welcome. I, I'd love to have you give everyone, um, maybe those who may not know, an overview of Free From. And um, also when I interviewed you for the commons, we discussed your new policy map tool, which I kept calling a dashboard, but it's a tool, map tool. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that as, as well. Sure, absolutely. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Sasha, for that intro. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, talking about life in the slow lane, which more than anything is something I aspire to. <laughs> um, FreeFram is a national organization. We are a little over four years old, which truly in the grand scheme of social change is, is just out of the womb. Um, and we are really addressing the issue of intimate partner violence. Um, the way that we think about intimate partner violence in this country is as a natural disaster or you know, a series of unfortunate events and random occurrences. Uh, we think that a warm bed and public assistance for a couple of weeks or months is all that is needed to solve the problem. And what Free From is trying to do is reframe the narrative to reframe this as a systemic issue, a systemic economic issue, uh, the number one obstacle to safety for individual survivors generations and communities of survivors is financial insecurity. And to build an ecosystem of support and to really bring in all the different pillars of our society to address the problem. And that is an extremely lofty goal. Um, and, uh, you know, someone asked me once, when people look back and, and say, what did Free From do? What was their contribution? Um, I think it, just that, that first sliver, which is to say, I, I hope that people are like, that's when we started to think about this differently. I don't expect that people will attribute all of the change that happened to Free From, nor do I want them to, because if, if they do, it stayed too small. Um, but really we see ourselves as starting to build that community, that, that ecosystem, that um, infrastructure around solving this problem the hard way. And can you tell 
everyone a little bit about, I know that you are just recently starting to launch the mapping tool. Oh, I'm tool. sorry, you're right. No, no, that's tool. okay. Go ahead. Well, interestingly, uh, you know, when we talked, Karen and Sasha, in December, I told you that it was launching on January 26th. But embracing life in the slow lane, we decided it needed more time, and we're going to be launching it in early March. Um, but this is a 50-state map and scorecard. We have cataloged all of the policies and legislation that every state in the US has uh, that would help or hurt survivors' financial security. We have given every state a score and we have given them recommendations for what they can do better, to do better, to get a higher score, to support survivors' financial security. We've also got very easy ways for folks to tweet at their local representative and push for change to get involved in local advocacy in their state. Um, and again, to us, that is the blueprint. We don't foresee that we will enact change in all 50 states in Freefem's lifetime, but here's the starting point. And um, what our hope is, is that change starts to happen in states that we weren't even, no one even brought us in, you know? They looked at our website, they saw this thing, they went ahead and did it and we're none the wiser. And that's sort of my dream for everything Free From does is that we create conditions and we create context and we create community that then takes this idea or their own idea and runs with it within that context. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, so we have our final panelist um, is, is Eric. And Eric, can you give us a primer on Peace First? And again, when I got a chance to interview you, I was really blown away with what you're doing. So we'd love to hear about what you're doing and how you came about. And um, also like to hear about your slow lane implementation of your platform. Um, yeah. Um, hey, y'all. Um, I'd say it's nice to see you, but um, I, I can't see you. Um, but I'm imagining the 98 of you out there in the world uh, listening in. Um, thank you so much for joining. And um, I look forward to the world where um, we get to be in a room together, um, swapping stories. And, and thank you to all of the folks who, who organize this panel, um, but both the, the folks that we can see and all the many um, hands uh, who 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 um, put these things together. Uh, I know there are a lot of work and, and vision that goes into it. Um, so um, I was a really um, I was a really pissy kid. Um, I, I was angry a lot of time. I, I thought the world was unfair. Um, my guess is many of you um, felt that way, and probably many of us still do because the world is unfair. Um, um, and so. Um, I really found my redemption in, in youth organizing. Um, I went to a huge public high school. I, I grew up in the Midwest uh, here in the United States. Um, and for me, it was the first time I got to feel uh, powerful um, that I could transform time and, and, and space. And um, what I realized is so few young people get to feel powerful. You know, young people are the only group of human beings that are talked about exclusively as potential. Right, right, right. What they're going to be, right? Folks like me go into schools and tell young people that if they uh, work hard and, and and don't do drugs, that someday they'll be great leaders, artists, writers, you know, what have you, right? They are um, um, victims. We need to protect. They're perpetrators. We need to punish, or, or they're the future. Um, and of course, if you if you look at research or or read the news or or just talk to a smart young person, you know that not only is that that not true. Um, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous um, model to move through the world in because what happens is the 1.6 billion young people on the planet uh, who represent the greatest single untapped human capital resource for good um, are not only forgotten, um, they sit at the bottom of the privilege pyramid, right? So if we want to talk about domestic violence, uh, intimate partner violence, um, you know, who is watching that happen? You know, who sits... Um, at the result of climate change or the arguments over ed reform, or we could have, you know, fill in the blank, uh, yet is never invited to be part of those conversations. So um, our work at Peace First is to unleash young people's moral imaginations to solve problems. So you can think of what we do as being 
like a Khan Academy for social justice. Uh, so we help 13 to 25 year olds all over the world figure out what they care about. We help them build a theory of change for how they wanna care about it. Um, using compassion as a driver, meaning they need to talk to folks who are uh, affected by the problem. They need to talk to folks who are causing the problem. And then we provide digital design tools to help them build projects. We provide funding. Uh, we give money to young people and we only give it to young people. We try to give it to them in 48 hours. They don't have to keep receipts. And then we connect them with caring adult mentors uh, if they want them. Um, some of the projects are really small. It's, it's three 13 year olds who go into their school cafeteria and find that one kid no one is sitting with and they go and sit with them. And some are big and complicated. We're helping a group of young people in Uganda and Italy who are mapping every single defibrillator on the planet. Um, some are social justice oriented. We're helping a group of young people who are training the police in Baltimore on how to work with young people of color. Uh, some are for-profit businesses. We're helping a group of young people in rural Columbia who created an eco bike tour. Uh, the point is we don't tell young people what to solve or how to solve it. Uh, we just help them do it. Um, and then if they want to, we help them scale. Uh, so we don't privilege scale. Um, but we help them scale projects if they want to. So we've built the world's very first venture philanthropy fund. Uh, we're coming in close to $10 million, which will be the single largest direct investment in young people to scale social justice work. So the next level is $2,500 to go through an accelerator and then 25,000 if they wanna globalize their work. So we, we move behind uh, young people's uh, vision and work um, wherever and however they wanna, they wanna do that. Um, so right now we're supporting about 8,000 projects in 150 countries. Um, and what's interesting is so much of our original speed, uh, and I'm embarrassed to, to say this, I'm, I'm hanging my head in shame for people who are not watching visually, um, uh, was driven by adults and adult needs. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's a really interesting thing for us to dig into is, um, is the fast lane for whom uh, and to do what? Um, and so there were uh, funders uh, who wanted us to do certain things in certain ways. And so as I think about our movement into the, into the slow lane, um, it was thinking about how do we drive behind young people's visions and needs and understanding that sometimes meant backing up um, and slowing down. And in our case, we had been a school-based program uh, about five years ago. Uh, we shut down our multi-million dollar 90-person program operation and started over as an eight-person tech company. Um, so that's not even moving to the slow lane. That's stopping and getting out and um, getting a soda and a burrito um, and sitting around and having a picnic and talking for a while. Um, and so um, it's been an interesting journey. Um, but, I, but I think the question that, that is the core of this panel um, is always um, at which pace for whom um, and to do what. So great, so really great. Um, so now that our introductions are complete, let's sort of dive deeper into the slow lane. So Sasha, we've discussed it and, and you gave us some, some backgrounds in your introduction about what the slow lane is. Let's talk about why it's such a crucial idea right now. Yeah, so I think I think it's important for a number of reasons. Um, I start with the reason that happened 13 years ago in the global financial crisis. And when our um, financial system collapsed and all the world's leaders turned to experts from finance and economics to fix it, to, to put it back in order. And um, for many people around the world, for millions and millions of people, um, this meant a decade of unbelievable hardship of um, increasing unemployment. At the time I lived in Spain and we had a youth unemployment of over 50% that still persists today. Um, in the UK, um, people had to choose between heating and food for years every winter. Um, and it was a very, very rushed decision and as Eric was saying, for whom? It was to keep the lenders happy. That was the story. And we were, um, we were sold the idea and, and we accepted it. We asked our leaders to lead, right? We enabled them um, to make that choice. But it turned out that three, five years into it, things weren't getting any better, but we were seeing another part of society doing rather well. 
and walking away again with the bonuses and so forth. So I think that's the kind of, um, and that, that's been breeding. And of course that's been breeding terrible um, distrust, terrible breeding ground for, for hate, for populism, for division in our society that, that we feel every day and that hopefully we're going to heal from. Um, but there's also a, a, a shorter, sh shorter story to this is that we're glorifying the fast lane economy. We're glorifying um, the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, the people that are supposedly disrupting the world by these quick fix technologies. And really, when you look at the look at it from the point of view of the problems we are facing, generally they're solving one problem by creating another. And I think um, and and the introductions by Sonia and Eric were so brilliant in terms of showing just how. Um, we can approach things differently and it's a harder way of doing it by trying to find a way of solving a problem and solving it and that's it. So, um, so the, 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 the slow lane for me is really, um, and, and I've been looking at it over the past months intensively, um, I found, and it's resonating in a lot of the stories um, um, we've already heard, it has these. Um, it has for me four guiding principles that that seem to be guiding people as they're as they're trying to bring about social change. Um, one is a deep willingness to listen, and listening is not asking a question. Listening is not asking, "Do you want A or B?" Listening is actually not putting an end to the conversation. Is seeing where it takes you, and so I think when you're approaching this from a traditional product design point of view and things that we've done ourselves in our organization was to listen for answers rather than listen for what do these people need. Um, another part is this holding the urgency. Um, I said earlier, we measured our success by how fast we were moving. And so I, 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 I translated the urgency I had for bringing about change directly into everything we were doing and it began to trump other in, in considerations like community equity, like uh, inclusiveness, like building real assets, um, uh, which kind of has this brings us to this third quality that I think is about you know everything we're doing tries to heal democracy, right? Empowering um, the 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 people struggling, you know, whether it's the youth or or people struggling from um, intimate violence, you know, that's actually however successful they are in what we're doing in our intervention, every time we're doing that, we're adding people to our democracy, where we're building structure and infrastructure that in itself has value, irrespective of the things we're trying to fix. And the last thing, and in many ways, the hardest thing is this, this curiosity. You know, all of us wake up in the middle of the night um, thinking, oh, that maybe there's a better way of doing this, or maybe we should do more tech, or maybe we should do less, or maybe we should put more money. So this constant curiosity of trying to, you know, and that's linked to that urgency, right? We don't want to drag our feet, um, but we also don't want to destroy anything by rushing over it. So I, you know what, I, I had a question come in and I, I'd love to open it up to all the panelists. Um, so someone would like to know, could you please elaborate on the new metrics you use to measure what success looks like and the impact of your work in communities in the slow lane. And I think if all of our panels panelists could probably answer this, but Sasha, why don't you start and then hand it off <laughs> to someone? Yeah, so, um, so I think a really good way of measuring it is by something we avoided for 10 years, which was our, our approach avoided community engagement as, an, um, as a piece of, of the process we were offering, specifically because it would be faster if we don't. And it was also hard for us to organize this globally, you know, in remote places. Um, and so we, we, to keep things lean and moving, we actually didn't measure that. And I look back and I look at friends of mine who've built organizations in one community over 10 years with only one purpose, to let that community find out what they want. Right in the same time that I went into, into 135 cities, they stayed in one place and, and listened. And so this for me is one of those metrics um, of measuring how much the community takes ownership and control of this and is given the time to really come up with their own answer. That I would say is a completely new metric that is changing everything for what I'm doing. And so I'll hand it over to Sonia. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you to the person that asked it. You know, the way that we think about intimate partner violence in this country is we think about it as something that happens over days and weeks. And we sometimes even go further than that and, you know, split decisions and, you know, deciding to leave. And we really measure a survivor's uh, strength by whether or not they left. And then we measure our interventions by how many days did we provide that person in the shelter? Uh, were we able to get them into Section 8 housing? Um, how were we able to get them a restraining order? Were we able to get them access to public assistance? None of that tells you anything about whether this person is safe, feels safe, um, and can create safety in their home. We think about, or our society thinks about, intimate partner violence in days and weeks. Survivors think about our safety and our experience in years and generations. And so if we're gonna respond to a generational problem then the very nature of it is we're probably not going to see it to the finish line. And we have to be okay with that. And, you know, Sasha and I have talked about this so much. I think there's a couple reasons why we're all compelled to the fast lane. I think there's just, you know, we, all live with a certain amount of anxiety and a great way to quell anxiety is to keep moving and to not actually just sit with the anxiety and explore it and see why it's coming up it's a way it's, there's tv and then there's keep moving and those are the ways to numb it i think the second is like we live in in a society that values individualism and the way to succeed if we see ourselves as operating within that system is to stand out and to set ourselves apart. And ultimately that is like a race to who takes credit for the thing first, um, which I would argue then causes more of the anxiety and therefore you keep rushing and so now you're in a loop. Um, and then I think that the third is the way that our you know, for lack of a better word, nonprofit industrial complex is set up is we are reliant on funding that is one year, two year, maybe, you know, really forward thinking funders three years. But in return for that money, they want results and measurable results. And we've gotten to a point where, you know, you need to have KPIs and you need to have put numbers on what you will achieve um, to a point where if I played into that, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my sights really small so that I know I can deliver what you asked for in 12 months or 24 months, as opposed to keeping my eye on that 40 year, 50 year, 60 year vision and working towards that in the way that it needs me to. Um, and I think that plays into, you really have to uh, actively be working to dismantle that whole perspective every day because all of the messages you are receiving from the world are telling you to do otherwise. They're telling you the fast lane is the right lane. Um, and you know, every day I make a to-do list and then I'm like, okay, but what on here actually needs to get done and what on here uh, do I just feel rushed to do? And I'll just add uh, on on to that as, as another plus plus one to to, to Sonia and thank you Rohan. Um, um, it also um, de incentivizes risk, right? Both both in terms of innovation and trying things out, but also working with folks who are more risky. You know, it's one of the things that I I worry about around like performance bonds, right? Where we're paying for performance in terms of what it incentivizes. Um, so I think what I'll add um, to, to my esteemed colleagues' thoughts um, around, you know, what I hear at the core of that question is what's different thinking about measurements um, with a slow lane versus a fast lane perspective. Um, so if we understand evaluation is fundamentally asking, did we do what we said we were going to do and how well did we do it? Um, I think a slow lane invites us to think about two things differently. Um, one is what a colleague of mine calls um, a, a justice lens. 
Um, so a justice lens asks um, who is and, and, and who isn't here. Um, so, so, you know, in the case of Peace First, it's not just looking at the amount of money given out, the number of projects, but to whom are we giving money? Um, who's getting access to these resources? Um, and so that, that um, invites us to look at, um, are we reaching young people with, with lived experience of the problems that they're solving? Um, how are we building tools um, that are reaching young people with low literacy or no literacy rates? Um, how are we reaching young people in refugee camps in Syria? Um, which then of course gets us to think about our design principles from the very beginning, um, right? And so the justice lens um, as an evaluation isn't just asking, did we do what we said we were going to do, but it interrogates, and I mean that in a, in a, in a Sasha way with curiosity, um, who is or who isn't here at the table. And then the other thing, it, um, you know, I, I wanna just pulse back for a second. If we think about this, this triangle of impacts where um, we've got um, uh, direct service, right? How do we feed, clothe, teach? Um, and then we've got policy, right? How do we use the levers of government to create impact? Um, th this third lever, uh, this third side of the triangle is around culture change, right? Which is how do we change the, the stories that we tell about ourselves and that, that we then tell about the world, right? So Sonia, when you were talking so, so beautifully a minute ago, um, you know, you weren't just talking about, in my mind, um, you know, not just how do we change a service delivery model, but how do we tell the story about, how do we change the story about um, intimate partner violence? Like how do we, how do we change the stories that we tell um, about, about those humans that are involved in, 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 in those moments and what those moments mean for us? Right, and so that is not just about policy. That's not just about a program. It's about culture change. And we did this really interesting research and, and actually De De Deloitte did this research with us. Uh, we looked at um, movements over the past 120 years from the workers' rights movement to, to the Arab Spring. So 120 years worth of culture change movements that created new cultural norms, you know, from the concept of a weekend, uh, to marriage equality, which you know changed our conception of love, like all these moments, is a fascinating piece of research. If anybody wants to reach out and geek out about that, that could be a whole other panel. Um, but what I want to lift up in, in this conversation as we think about about impact, um, what was interesting is is what drives that those changes is paying attention to internal as well as external change, um, that it requires internal shifts as well as external shifts, which of course are much harder and much more complicated and much more messy and to funders out there much more expensive to track and understand. Um, and so we need to begin to think about how do we track those things like belonging? How do we track those things like narratives and stories? How do we think about um, tracking those, those internal shifts as well as the external shifts, right? Because um, th those stories that we tell um, about ourselves in the world are an important lever uh, for creating change as much as policy uh, and as much as direct service. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about is why taking the slow lane has been so important for everyone's work. Um, and I think it sort of ties into the next question as well, which is in a quick fix, like instant gratification world, how do we accept that we're not going to fix things quickly? So maybe we can start with Sasha and, you know, talk about that. Yeah, I think I think that's a um, um, you know I think that 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 has a lot to do with experience, right? So um, so I've observed this kind of pattern of people jumping from action to action in all kinds of contexts, right? I was in um, in Pentonville Prison in in London in two thousand fifteen, and um, there the prison governor in charge of the prison for the first time in 170 years, 
had held a meeting with prisoners to listen about what they need. It took 170 years of jumping from action to action and the financial crisis, by the way, um, to suck funding out of the prison to the point that it became unmanageable for him to sit down. Um, but, and, and he was supported by a fabulous um, nonprofit called User Voice that had done that work in other prisons. So the idea was on standby. It had been floating around. Here's something you can do. But he needed to come to precisely in a way that point that also Eric hinted to, right? That alignment of internal realization. I'm not the owner of this. I don't just go from fix to fix, but I need help. And I need help from the people I'm supposed to be telling what to do. Um, and that happens at, um, so I think that happens at different scales. That happens in government, that happens in these, um, in public services, that happens at our dinner table, right? I mean, it, it happens all the time. Um, where this is so so the acceptance I think comes from that re recognition right it has a lot to do with how do I define my leadership role or my my power my dominance over others and so forth and from there it then I think it becomes honestly a path of beautiful discovery in many ways you know if, if someone shows you a little bit of light it's not that hard to find these principles and and the way of going about it but I think so so I think that point to me has been and I've myself gone through this process, so maybe I kind of, I, I just was a really late comer to that discovery. But it's really, I see it play out over and over, and it seems to be happening. That's the kind of seed, right, that, that allows this, this, this change, that acceptance to happen in some ways. How about our other speakers? Sonia? I think, like, the key word that you said there, Sasha, was dominance. And we uh, live in a society that celebrates dominance. You know, the, the Jeff Bezos is and the Elon Musk is Musk of the world. Like we all hate billionaires, but they're all we talk about. <laughs> um, and if you can, if you can, I guess, heal enough yourself to not, to not need to dominate in order to, to feel safe, to feel seen, to feel important, to feel validated, um, then you can just do the work to do the work. And, you know, the biggest critique that Free From gets, uh, and Sasha and I talked about this almost always from people in the tech world, um, is we're doing too much. And someone went as far as to say to one of my employees in December, you're doing too much. You should focus on one thing and get really good at it. And uh, my experience has been that organizations that do too much are lacking a, a purpose. And so you should all, you know, really go and reflect on if you even have a mission. Which, besides the fact that it's ludicrous and also completely inappropriate to talk to someone like that, um, it just is like it's it's actually been scientifically disproven at this point. You know, like we have moved past the stage of human uh, development where we think monocropping is the right thing to do. And we all know that monocropping destroys the earth. And we all know that the thing that saves the earth and means that we can sustain this life inevitably is a diverse ecosystem. And so why we continue to ignore the science and ignore all the proof and demand dominance, I think, is something that we really collectively need to interrogate and heal and, and get over um, so that we can uh, become more effective and we can thrive together. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm giving Sonia a big smile. It just it reminds me of all the stupid things people say to nonprofit leaders. And I don't know, maybe we'll form a drinking game and, you know, it doesn't have to be alcohol, it could be uh, peppermint tea. I, it's like when people say like, there's just too many nonprofits, you should merge. And I remember being with a funder, a corporate funder, and I shouldn't have said this. And I was like, yeah, I feel the same way about banks. There's just too many banks. Like you all more or less do the same thing. Like we really just need one of you. Anyway. Um, I, I just want to add um, uh, two, two, two thoughts. Um, so, so one is I think that um, I think the world needs um, um, different 
pacing for different problems, right? So I think we need fast lane solutions for certain things. And I think we need slow lane solutions for certain things, right? So if I, um, um, you know, get shot in my neighborhood, I'm going to the hospital, like, I don't want a group of doctors, like, ask me how I'm feeling and like, like, kind of creating an emergent strategy about what to do. Like, I want them to get the bullet out, like, whatever you like, you know, whatever you're going to do, do that. Um, and so I think what we're kind of lifting up here is the imbalance and the privileging. And, you know, so Sonia, you said this so well, kind of the, um, um, kind of the like whiteness and the maleness and the wealth around that gravitational pull of where those solutions come from. Um, you know, we just had the, the new year. I don't know how many of y'all used to uh, make new year's resolutions. I used to do it all the time. Uh, and then like by February 3rd, I was back doing whatever I was doing. So I started um, coming up with a word that I reflect on for the year. And um, for many years, the word I would, um, I, I sat on was this concept of, of, of humility. Um, and and um, I, there's just something I keep coming back to as I think about the slow lane as being rooted in humility. Um, and, and humility to me is, is not about lowering yourself. Um, it, it's about how do we create space for other voices? Like, how do we, how do we like, you know, with, with, with our muscles and, and our love, like draw the circle bigger. Um, and really humility is a push against this throwaway urgency culture that we live in. And so the mantra that I want to offer to us is, is that um, not everything that has to be done has to be done. <laughs> Right, not everything that has to be done is important. Not everything that is important has to be done right now. Not everything that has to be done right now has to be done by us. Um, and I think it's that cycle that um, that that we need to um, that we need to lean into, right? That is about um, that is about humility. Um, and to me, that's what the slow lane is about. I mean, Sasha, you laid this out so well with 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 your opening, and and Sonia, what you were describing about is is um, you know was was a brilliant example of that. Um, but that's really, I think, what what we need more of is is that humility, that that opening up, that stretching. I think something you said there, Eric, was super interesting. You 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 said um, we need to understand we need to have more nuance about whether this is a crisis or not and whether it requires a fast lane response or a slow lane response and i think part of what we do is we don't take time to understand the root of a problem and so we are quick to categorize things as crises domestic violence is not a crisis it is a product of our society over over centuries, we have created and maintained and supported the conditions that allow this type of violence to occur. Um, but we have somehow tricked ourselves into thinking it's a crisis. That, that being shot with a gun, I mean, gun violence is also not a crisis, but being shot with, by a gun is a crisis for your body and, and requires immediate fast lane solutions. Um, addressing patriarchy and misogyny and uh, white supremacy, these are, these are the things that we will spend our entire time on this earth trying to solve. Um, and so I guess creating space in our society to make sure we understand a problem before we set about our solution or cement our solution. We can of course explore many solutions and get to the right one, but to really categorize things right, I think is a, is a really important starting point. So I, I'd love to give our attendees some some advice and some some maybe some tools to take into their own organization. So how did you come to the conclusion, all of you, that technology doesn't work for every problem? And I, I wonder, would you all agree that tech is inherently risky and expensive and, and um, you know, how do you figure out how to reduce risk and save money? Um, Sonia, do you want to answer first? Sure. So Freeform uses technology in different parts of our work. We have a, a compensation tool that allows you to see 
uh, how you might get money for the harm you've experienced in your state. So we've taken, there's like four legal avenues. We've, we've broken those down into really easy to understand language. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to know where to look on your state's you know, uh, website. Um, and then we have the map and, and scorecard that we talked about earlier. And that's kind of it. And we've gotten a lot of pushback from tech uh, funders and tech entrepreneurs that we are either not investing all of our time in one of those two solutions or that we aren't using technology across the board. But I think the answer sort of lies in, in what I just said, which is we are a team of survivors who were thinking about this issue before Freeform existed, but spend every single day talking to each other, talking to other survivors about why the problem exists. So I know that for a lot of survivors, they're gonna wanna explore how they might get compensation. But of course, many of those avenues to compensation uh, require you to have a police report or require you to at least engage with law enforcement to the point at which they kind of drop your case or uh, require you to be in court with the person that harmed you. And so I know that not everybody's gonna wanna do that. So then every time we explore a solution and it gets us part of the way, but it's not gonna get us the whole way, the question that we ask is, so what else? And as you start to put solutions together, you're naturally gonna get to something that feels like an ecosystem, but we have like, you know, laws in our country that are at a state level and at a federal level that are working against the problem that we are trying to solve. I can't create an app to fix that. You know, like I've got to engage with humans. Survivors are, but part of the way that intimate partner violence thrives is it isolates people. And it creates such financial devastation that um, you're not able to engage in your community and in your society in a way that you once could or would want to. I can't create an app for breaking isolation either. And so to really understand like there is an isolation problem here which requires community building. There is a, an access issue here which I could probably solve with the tech but then there's a, a different pillars of our society taking accountability issue, which requires network building. It requires uh, lobbying, legislation. Uh, and then there's the culture change stuff, which I also cannot end or create or develop with an app. And to really um, get over ourselves and our like obsession with easy fixes, tech is an easy fix. That's what it is. And there are so many problems, particularly around access and particularly around um, communication that tech is so good at fixing, but uh, we're not facing all of the challenges we are simply because, you know, the dictionary was a 700 page book and people needed access to it quicker. Like there's, we're humans and, and we can't solve the human element of our problems through technology alone. Eric, I'd love to hear you answer the same question, please. Yeah, I mean, the I don't know if any of you saw or remember the movie, My, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, that seminal work of art. Um, uh, I just, I think about the, the dad's sort of use of Windex to solve everything. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's how we, we, we treat technology. It, um, it does some things really well, like Windex cleans windows really well. Um, you know, but, but I question it, its use of, 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 of doing other things. And, and so for me, it's, it's, an, it's an alignment question uh, and a privileging question um, more than anything else. And so, you know, for us, um, we wanted to be able to reach young people um, on their timetables, right? So if you're a young person right now and it's 10 o'clock on a Thursday night and you're angry because you're being bullied or you're watching bodies wash up from the civil war in Syria, like there's not a lot of places you can go in that moment of obligation. And so we wanted to create an always on available place for you to be able to connect with resources. Technology is a great fix for that. Um, you know, if you don't have internet access in, in rural Nigeria, it doesn't fix that, right? So it doesn't fix everything. 
um, it fixes some things. Um, and so it's being clear about what it fixes uh, and then how it fixes and then what it doesn't and how it doesn't. Um, and so for us, it has been leaning into um, um, building things in, in partnership with our young people. So everything that we build has been built um, by young people, um, designed, uh, created, and often technically built as well. Um, the other thing that we learned is to build things that are really simple and inexpensive, and therefore, um, you know, not very pretty um, and kind of um, clunky. And um, my team uh, will hate me for saying this, but 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 you know, um, could be better. Um, but it works, right? So it's building just enough. Um, and so, you know, someone who is working in a tech startup in, in San Francisco and is used to a certain um, look and feel, um, you know, a 16 year old in, in, in Mangalore in India, like doesn't necessarily need all of that. Um, and so part of this has been figuring out too, how to build just enough um, in real time um, for the folks who need it uh, and investing um, behind those needs rather uh, than in front of those needs. Sasha, what advice do you give to people who maybe are, you know, trying to figure out which technology they should be looking at, or you know, how do you help people come to the? How how did you come to the conclusion that technology doesn't work for every problem, and you know, what advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we came to that conclusion the very hard way, and and I think maybe one dimension to add here is. One of the reasons why technology is so risky is not so much the technology itself, but it's the whole dynamic around it. So when we reached the point where we were thinking about how do we scale from 135 cities to ideally every city on earth or 500,000 of them, um, we, we spoke to investors and most investors said to us, you can either be a tech company or you can be a service provider as you are now, a consulting service, a handholding service. You can't be both. And so we, we were cut in this kind of, this T-section, you know, where we had to choose left or right. And, and it was literally at the time, we didn't really find anyone who was willing to go in between. And there was certainly nothing in the, in the way of follow on financing perspectives and so forth. Um, and then with that came a whole dynamic well, okay, if you want to be tech, where's your tech team? Where's your head of product? Where's your, who are your engineers? How are you hiring them? How are you retaining these people? They don't want to work in a consulting firm doing some little app on the side. They want to be, you know, and you're not an engineer, Sasha, you know, you're not, you're not a tech leader. You're not never going to build a great tech team. Um, and so it became, and then, you know, quickly investors, when we raise more investment, they were like, are you doing AI? You know, I'll, I'll invest if you're doing AI. AI and procurement sounds great. Let's do that. So um, it quickly unraveled into its own dynamic. And, and I think this is, this is familiar to, to others. Um, and, and I think we realized then later on, we were like, okay, we let go of a lot of the things that people really needed, which was we'd focus on automating the process, the workflow, and building the tools and making them much cheaper and, and self-service. Um, but what we left out was the human relationship we had built with the people we were helping and working with and how we were motivating them. We found out much later, years later, that people were afraid when we were consultants of working with us because we were so demanding, but they loved it when they did it because they were as good as the best other people in the world. So we'd overlooked all of that, right? So, so I would say um, the role of technology there is, is something we need to be careful with the dynamic it creates. And I would say another thing, and I think I encourage anyone um, to look up societalplatforms.org. Um, it's a fabulous framework for thinking about public interest technology. And one of the first design principles of this is no business model, it's free and open, right? Don't even try to build public infrastructure and, and try to somehow, you know, accept that you're creating it open and you're making it, you're making it easy for everyone to contribute and that it's shared and that it's not owned. 
And I think those design principles would have been immensely helpful for us early on. They just didn't exist at the time. Um, but I think the, the dynamic, and, and I love how I followed Eric's transition and, and, and I hear also how Sonia very selectively uses technology in places where it matters. And I think technology really invites you into a new universe. It's not that you're taking the one thing you're doing and then putting it online. It becomes a different animal. And I think that transition is very hard. And then the alternative to that is to, to be a little more mix and match between both worlds and, and force your funders also to the table and say, this is the right path. So that actually brings us right to our next question. So how do you push back when partners or funders or another organization tries to force technology on you and sort of ask you to implement the latest buzzword or technology that they've heard about in the Gartner hype cycle? Um, you know, I'd love to hear about examples of when you've been asked to rush technology, how you push back and if you succeeded and, and even more important, what the outcome of, outcome of that decision has been. Um, so Sasha, why don't you, why don't you start? Okay, I'll, I'll stay right with it. So, um, um, so I think one of the things we, we, we built um, um, was a design tool for people in government to frame better questions that they would ask through procurement. And um, the way what we learned about it, that it had a lot to do with problem framing, getting to the root cause of what you're actually trying to accomplish. So when they wanted to buy a traffic signal to help them understand that really what they wanted was a safer street crossing. And then to show them what was possible, to show them that there was not just one way of making the street crossing safer, but 30. So we built all that and it required a fair amount of um, um, technology. The challenge with that is, and I think, I think in many ways we did the right things and we built the right things. The challenge is that the world expects that within the life cycle of your current investment round, you then get the exponential uptake that will sustain it and show traction and so forth. And what we found was the severe disconnect between moving, um, building technology and a slow moving market. Um, you know, I think I came to realize that in what we demonstrated in 10 years in 135 governments is enough food for thousands of governments for probably the next 10 years to digest, right? They don't need us more and more pushing. They actually need to make sense of what we've put out there. And so I think, and, and I think that dissonance between the speed of uptake and so forth, I think having the long breath, um, I think was really, really central. And I think we were, we were chasing traditional investment rounds at a time when the market, you know, couldn't take more, right? It couldn't, it wasn't ready for, for everything we were throwing at it. Okay, Sonia, how about you? You walked away from something that was adamant that we do it one way and not the other way. Um, that, that really wanted us to have a single product focus. And that was probably the worst example where we just were like, okay, well, thank you, but no, thank you. It's not, it's not worth the, the $30,000 you're offering. Um, and then in other cases, it's a lot of... Um, explaining our way, listening to why we're wrong, and then taking the money and doing it our way anyway. Because ultimately they are trusting us. They just sort of you know, want us to know that, that their way is better. Um, and then we went through this actually once with a, one of our, with a big funder who there were certain people on the board that had a really strong sense that we were doing too much. And that if they were gonna invest in us, we needed to pick two things, I think was the arbitrary advice. Um, and over the course of the first year of working with us, they got to see our work, they got to see who we work with, they got to see how one thing said the other thing that said the other thing that during COVID, when so much of nonprofit activities were shut down or frozen, we kept going because we had enough different things going on that while one was slow, another could move more quickly and vice versa. 
that at the end of that first year, they they were like, we were wrong. And, and you see that now. And that's, that's always extremely satisfying, but also, of course, not the norm. The norm is you walk away from the funding or the funding is taken away from you. Um, and so I think there's so much education that needs to happen here for funders. It is so rare that the people with the money are the experts about the actual problem that, that you are trying to solve. And to really um, have our, our folks that are holding the wealth and holding the uh, ability to solve these problems, to have them really uh, interrogate the fast lane slow lane, I think is, is Sasha's next piece of work. Eric, same question to you. Um, so I, I'm going to um, share a slightly different story, which is um, more how my own um, stupidity um, got in the way of um, doing the kind of listening uh, to our constituents that um, in our community that's necessary to do good work. Um, uh, I'm partly driven by funding, but that's kind of like blaming the the obvious. Um, we we um, we, we uh, were invited to a new part of the world and um, there was a, 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 we got funding to do that work. And as part of that, we built this coalition, an amazing group of, of youth serving organizations um, who, who really represented, um, you know, an interesting cross section of those doing important work with young people. Um, and, and we did what you do when you build a coalition. Um, we spent a lot of time with them, figuring out their needs, how to get those needs met. Um, and spent, you know, maybe 250, 300,000 pound dollars, oops, um, wherever this may have been. Um, and, um, and, and realized like a year in that we'd spent all this time building and constructing around adult needs, like, like whose logo is where and what their needs are. Um, and like no fault of the organizations, like they were doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, we, we, we serve maybe like 50 teams of young people um, and, you know, had a similar experience in another country where, where I met this really like cool, interesting 24 year old um, who's like, this is amazing. I want to sign up and do a project. She did a project. She told 12 of her friends, they told 12 of their friends and we like 500 team sign up in, 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 in about a month. And, and it just, it was like, right. Like that is, that's the work. It's, it's like, why do I keep going back to these systems, right? This technology of working through these institutions and these collaborations that are not youth centered, um, that are not youth driven, that don't work. Um, but like the gravitational pull is so strong because it's what I knew. It's what I grew up in. It's, it's, it's the logos that attract resources and it's a lesson I have to learn again and again and again. So when I was sitting here and I was editing the issue, it hit me that the three organizations that we have really represent like th sort of three generations of progress. I'm not talking about the CEOs, I'm talking about the actual organizations. So Eric's organization has been around for nearly 30 years, Sonia is Sonia's organization is really part of that like digital native generation and Sasha's work sort of falls right in the middle. So I'm curious how the slow lane affects each generation and how you can make this slow lane process work for each. I think it, it's probably very different for, you know, an organization that's been around for 30 years versus something, you know, that, that was launched fairly recently where, you know, people are used to everything's digital. So, Sonia, can we hear from the digital native generation for? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? I think I had some headphone issues before. Great. Um, you know, what I, th what, what I thought about when you said that, Karen, was less my digital nativeness um, and more the fact that I, you know, the benefit of Free From being a new organization is we actually got to learn a bit from the mistakes of our predecessors before we got going. 
and as we got going. And so essentially life in the slow lane to some extent was built into our formation and our creation. And uh, when I started the organization, I knew I wanted to do multiple things. I knew I didn't wanna just get really good at one thing. I, I knew that it was gonna take trying a lot of different strategies to start to get somewhere. Um, and I knew that because I had seen what had gone wrong in the single solution approach of the movement for the last 30 years. And so in a lot of ways, that's, that's our privilege. That's our, you know, we don't have to make those mistakes because someone made them before us. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see how to, to kind of explore what is the difference between having that baked into your foundation versus having to go through that shift. Um, and I think more and more, I'm not gonna say younger, but, but newer organizations are, are benefiting from that learning that generations before us had to do. Okay, so how about our, our, our I guess, Gen X, organization. Um, Eric, what about you? Um, I'm, I'm sort of wrapping my hands around around the way you structured the question. Um, uh, partly because, you, you know, I, I feel much more of, of a startup than, than even Sonia at this point um, with our latest iteration. Um, what I appreciate at, at the heart of the question is um, kind of what am I learning right now? Um, and, and how is that learning taking shape? Because because I've been doing this work for, for 28 years. And, and really, because my only other gainful employment has been Burger King, I guess, at, at this point in my, my, uh, my, my long work life. Um, so, um, you know, I think we, um, and again, you know, returning to an earlier point, I think it is, how do we understand... Um, the, the movements within ourselves as leaders and the movements within ourselves as organizations. So how do we create um, fast lane rhythms when we need fast lane time? How do we create um, slow lane rhythms uh, when we need um, uh, slow lane times? Um, and how do we understand what we are called to do organizationally? Um, and how do we hold to that calling um, when we are, uh, the world is telling us we have to move fast? Um, and so I think that has been the core of my journey. Um, you know, uh, technology in, in that sense is, is, a, is a distraction to the, to the question, because I imagine if we were, you know, in 1968 as, as activists and organizers, this exact same conversation was going on, a different set of actors and a different set of questions, or, you know, in the 1780s around religious structures. Like, it, this, this, is, this is the human question, right? It's sort of, how does change happen? and by whom and, and when and how. Um, and so the, the thing I think I will offer, um, because it's wintertime in Boston, um, is, is this um, metaphor of, of, of fallowness. Um, you know, as, as I look out in, into my, my backyard garden, which because I'm, you know, in the middle of Dorchester is, is about five feet by five feet. Um, you know, I, I look at that, that frozen piece of tundra um, and I, uh, I, I see it's inactive, right? It is fallow, it is not doing anything, um, which of course is, is untrue, um, that beneath that surface, there's a ton of activity going on. Um, uh, the worms are, are doing their business, the, the nitrogen is being returned to the soil. Um, and our ancestors appreciated that process, right? They, they understood that we leave our fields fallow every seven years, um, that we, we honor a Sabbath uh, where we rest. Um, and so, um, and so I'm, I'm getting a little um, spiritual with this, but um, bear with me for a moment. Um, uh, um, what is happening is we are, um, we, we conflate productivity with production, right? And so the, the heart of the, the fast, what's so problematic about the fast lane and therefore what is so revolutionary about the slow, slow lane um, is, is that we, we, we only understand ourselves being productive when we're producing. Um, and what the slow lane um, therefore honors is that there are lots of other ways of being productive. Um, um, conversations, curiosity, um, 
vacation. Um, the two most productive things I've done professionally in, in, in eight, 28 years of working are the two sabbaticals I've taken. And not because I did anything productive uh, with that time, um, but because my mind rested, my spirits rested. I reconnected with my kids and my wife um, and it opened things up in me that nothing else has. Um, and so I think that um, you know the invitation there is to not conflate those two things and to understand that like butterflies and, and, and kindergartners, we all need those restorative moments. And so I think what the slow lane invites us to do is to understand um, rhythms differently, um, but we're, we're not being any less productive. Uh, we're just producing in a way that looks different and, and maybe more silent. Yeah, I wanted to, you said two really great things there. I mean, you said a lot of great things there, but two things that I wanted to touch on, Eric. The first was you talked about nature and you talked about the, the frozen tundra outside your window. And you know, nature isn't confused. Nature isn't, isn't deceived by the fast lane. And indigenous communities on this land and around the world lived by nature. And in so doing, lived what we would call in the slow lane, but in a way that really allowed the community to thrive and um, to have enough resources and to, to um, sustain itself for, you know, indefinitely. Um, and, and then you mentioned, you know, production, uh, productivity and production. And of course, the birth of that equation is capitalism and um, the industrial revolution and colonization. And, you know, when I said earlier, we are learning from the mistakes of the generations before us, I, I want to put that in the context of there were people that inhabited this earth and indigenous communities still today that have not forgotten the slow lane and um, honored and protected it for centuries while we all uh, railroaded over it and murdered people and, and put highways in their place. Um, and so uh, to, to see how far we have diverted from all of the uh, truths that were told for so many, so many generations on, on this earth um, and to understand the history of it and to understand that you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot, just like you cannot try to solve uh, internal partner violence with technology alone, you cannot try to understand how we all ended up in the fast lane without talking about colonization and capitalism and the need for dominance that drives us all to stay in the fast lane. So I want to um, jump into this. This um, I'm, I'm the middle, the middle generation here, <laughs> supposedly. Um, I want to jump into um, into where what our points of reference were where we started. And I think Sonia, um, what you said is so true that there are more and more organizations now that from the from the root up have a different type of DNA. Um, I'm, I'm trained as an as an architect, and so and I trained at a at a very 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 good architecture school. And what we were taught taught about success was to be a star, producing beautiful coffee table books, usually devoid of people, but spectacular architecture. And it, it was really about you know the idealized form of that profession was. Um, you get your clients to build something that is probably totally dysfunctional, but that's kind of like your mark of success. And, um, and in the mid 1990s, I found myself in a slum in, in Venezuela working there and seeing for the first time seeing architects who had completely put themselves at the service of a community. Um, and it was really challenging for me because for one, you know, they weren't technically producing the best plan, right? It wasn't the best design, but the whole point of it was that this community in over 90 years had never had control over anything. And, um, and so, and I think this, this, this question, we heard about this question of decolonizing, right? Also one of the questions posted, I think, it, and it's a very, very hard journey 
to, to find your place within this. And the only way I knew, I didn't know there was a slow lane. I didn't know there was anything like that. All I could see was there was a social justice problem I wanted to, to fix. And then from there, everything else was, I want to grow as fast as Facebook. I want to be just like them. I just want, I want to be a successful entrepreneur. And, you know, I had no other language, no other vocabulary to understand the journey. And the challenge with that is, is manifold, right? And that's why I think, that's why I wanted to have this conversation about the slow lane. Once you appreciate that we might be on a 40 year journey, maybe you start to take the sabbatical, right? Once in a while, maybe you are, um, taking the time to let something sit, right? I mean, our decision was to, to just let City Mart sit and let the world come back to us when it's ready to do more. As an entrepreneur, that's a nightmare decision to take, right? But it's the only right decision to take, much like going into a community to listen, to get an answer by, by this time tomorrow, I need to know whether you want this electric scooter or that electric scooter is not listening. So I think the, the more, every time we're, we're loading ourselves with these expectations on what the journey will be like, how it will work, what we will do tomorrow and what deadline we're hitting and what milestone and how our personal journey will work out, the more we're undermining all the equity um, we're building. And it doesn't matter who we are, who's doing this. And so, um, so to me, I have to say, I stepped into a world that glorified the entrepreneur glorified the startup, that was my point of reference, and hadn't yet found the language to say, here's a social justice problem you're solving. And, and really as close as that came were definitions of social entrepreneurship, but they kind of almost inevitably tried to marry the two, right? Some people would say, oh, it's like Steve Jobs mixed with Mother Teresa. Well, it's not. Steve Jobs is the mistake in that equation. Right, it's, it's yes, the issue is there and yes, the kind of um, the resourcefulness and the creativity and the resilience to keep hanging in there and taking these risks. But the image of the disruptive domineering visionary who fixes things is just what is, what is so, so much in contrast to, to how the slow lane operates. I can't believe how fast our time is passing. I have so many more questions for you all. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to look at, you know, when we engage with humans and complex human and power structures, how do you find a way to deal with technology to change things? You know, is it even possible? And, and even more important, do you, do you want to do that? Um, Eric, do you want to jump in? I, I have a feeling you've got some <laughs> really good insight in this, into this. I, I, I've been talking a lot. I think I'll I'll, I'll pass to, to my colleagues. I, I want to make sure to leave time for for folks. Okay, um, Sonia. I mean, I was going to do the same thing. I don't know that I have anything to say there that I haven't already said. But maybe either Sasha, if you have something, or or maybe give me like a. a something that you feel like I haven't touched on, Karen? Um, yeah, we spent a lot of time together. I'm, I mean, Sasha, <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any feedback on this one? Or maybe we should move on to the next question, which I think is, I, I was actually interested to see the, the people that, that signed up. We have a lot of folks from um, the, the private sector on the call. And I'd love to hear about how you can take lessons that you've learned and possibly apply them to the private sector. Sasha, do you want to start us off? I can, I can, I can try. Um, so maybe, maybe kind of bridging a little bit with, with the prior question. I think one thing we haven't talked about yet, or I haven't talked about that um, we really struggled with the relationship between technology as a, as an, an accelerator of access and, and transactions and workflows um, and the competence and the mindsets of people who are supposed to use these tools. And I think for me, there's been a really enlightening uh, moment of growth that probably a lot of this community already knows 
around um, people using technology in really smart ways to build sophisticated skills and know-how. Um, for those of you who don't, who've never looked at it, uh, look at Project Echo, um, a, a doctor in New Mexico who realized that he couldn't treat hepatitis in the rural communities that were too far to drive to, and then walked practitioners in those communities through very complex treatments using video conferencing and now training hundreds of thousands of doctors around the world on very, very complex skills. And the reason why I mention this is that um, it comes back to this, this question of curiosity, right? Um, I think it's too easy to say technology cannot fix these things, but, and video conferencing, you know, these are Zoom calls originally, you know, um, most, most technologists won't even consider that building technology, but actually finding those opportunities to deliver this, this nugget of value. And then as you're doing that learning about how you can scale, how you can scale that up and following, in a way, following the value. Now, what I would say is, um, I mentioned this earlier, listening is a really central skill um, in the slow lane. And what I found in the business world, and I think the, the tech companies um, and social media are a fabulous example of how that goes wrong, listening taken to the extreme, right? Successful businesses are almost always good at, at listening, but what they listen for is not for a way to empower me, Erica, or Sonia, or others. They're listening for ways of tying us deeper into their products, tying us deeper into their business, um, locking us in. So I think if there's something to take away from if you're in business is to think, are the tools we use for listening, um, can we maybe deploy some of them as tools for empowerment and not just for dominance and not just for ways of making us more and more inevitable and maybe empowering uh, the other side. And I think it's, it's certainly for me, that's one of the big differences. And I, I honestly don't know how to reconcile those motivations, but I think um, it would be a powerful contribution to make just to be aware of this, right? That listening, you can be in a company, the listening, the chief listening officer, but you hold a lot of power with the way you're structuring that conversation. So I had other questions, but we have so many questions from our listeners. So I like brainstorm really quick. We're not going to get to all these questions and they're really fabulous questions. So um, I think what we're going to do is um, we're, I'm going to send out these questions or we'll have a, we'll talk and I'll get answers to all of your questions and we'll, we'll put them up on the commons um, and make sure that, you know, you can read them and, and, um, but why don't we take one of these questions, which I think is sort of interesting. Um, someone asked, have you seen examples where a slow lane approach is taken in government in spite of election cycles and administration changes? If so, could you share? And all of the speakers feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll pass on this one because I don't. Yeah, I haven't. All right, I'll, 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 uh, I'll answer this one. Um, and uh, actually, we, we, we wrote about some of this in, um, on the uh, New America blog of the, the, the Public Interest Technology Group around this approach of making austerity a community project. Um, right now, many, many governments, uh, local and, and otherwise, are embarking on these emergency budget cuts. And uh, they're implemented by and large without consulting the public, um, but led by experts and um, in part, this is motivated by wanting to take decisions quickly. In part, this is because supposedly budgets are complex and so forth. Um, but if you, look at, um, if you look at the UK, there are a couple of um, cities I'd like to point you to. Um, one is uh, the city of Sefton. And um, they, um, the government early on after the financial crisis realized that they were going to cut so much budget that the government no longer was able to be the patriarchal servant to the community delivering services, but would rely on the community to help them optimize those services. And um, in Sefton, as well as in, in Wigan, they retrained the government. All public employees were retrained to become 
to look at people they were serving, not as people with problems, but with capacity and try to involve them in solving the problem together. They tied in the voluntary sector um, to, to facilitate that process. And so what I'm describing here is a government having the humility to say, we're no longer able to serve you all um, in the way we thought we were in the past. And we're now becoming one of you. Yes, we bring resources and we have responsibility and we need to care. Um, and that was very successful. And in fact, it got them reelected um, um, with a majority halfway through the austerity. Um, Sefton is interesting. 50% um, of their budget was cut, not by any of their own doing, but by mandated by the central government. And just as they were about to no longer have to implement further cuts, COVID struck. And they had to cut yet again um, another 20% after they were down on their knees. And the only way they could do any of this was because the community now worked together with them to really, on a weekly basis, optimize the limited resources they had. And I think that's, um, it's, a, it's a really great story and, and we'll write about it, but um, you know, those are maybe a couple of cases to, to look at. So we're actually at the end of our time together, but I, I do want to read this question from Katina Michael, and she's actually at Arizona State University. And I, I hate this because I think all of our speakers could have answered this, but she says the word technology is in public interest technology. And I tell my students that the word technology should only be considered in context during the design prototyping stage, not problem definition, concept mapping, or discovery. But what if technology was considered a process, that even products were actually processes? And she wanted to know if the panelists agreed or disagreed with this approach. So think about that, because I'm going to be coming back and asking you to answer that. Um, but Sasha, since you were the one that came up with this fabulous idea, do you want to leave us with some final thoughts? And then I'll take it back to say goodbye to everyone. Oh, man. Um... Um, I, want to, I want to thank you, Karen and Sonia and Eric. I mean, this, this has been mind blowing. It's been everything I hope, I've, been, I've honestly been waiting for this panel probably for at least 10 years, if not longer. So I want to thank you for indulging, um, indulging me and reaffirming me in kind of what I'm learning, uh, learning this slow and hard way. Um, I think I want to leave the panel maybe with, with one thing, um, that, that issue of holding the urgency um, I think we've, we've, this panel has covered a lot of ground from technology and tactics and strategy and investors and funders, um, all the way to, um, to nurturing the ground in Eric's um, backyard. And I think the important thing here is to remember that um, every community I found in the slow lane, and there are a lot, um, has no lack of urgency, you know, is not slacking. If they're slow, it's intentional. If they're waiting, not doing something, it's intentional. Everyone is bursting to their seams with, with energy to solve things, but they're using slowness as a tool, as an instrument. And I think, um, I find that fascinating. And I think Sonia spoke to this, Eric spoke to this, to the kind of instinct in us to do more. And so I really hate the distinguish distinguishing between rushing and going slow. The slow lane is not about going slow. The slow lane is about letting things emerge when the time is right. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers too for spending so much time with us today, for being willing to sit on the phone and sit on Zoom and be interviewed by me to, for the next issue of the Commons. And I hope if ever anyone out there is interested in reading tomorrow's issue and hearing more about each of our panelists and their connections to the slow lane, We'd love it if you could use that URL you'll find right there in the chat to sign up for the email delivery. And in addition, we'd also like to invite you to attend our next New America Public Interest Technology webinar, which is on February 9th at noon Eastern. And that event's called From Dis Disaster to Recovery, Findings on a Broken Design and Delivery of COVID Housing and Un Unemployment Aid and Paths Forward. Um, and that'll fe feature speakers from our new practice lab and you'll also see the link to sign up right there in the chat box. And with that, I'd really like to thank everyone for attending today's event, Taking the Slow Lane, Why Technology Isn't the Only Answer. Hope everyone has a great day. <laughs>